Welcome everyone. Uh, my clock says noon on the dot, so we'll go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Uh, I'm Sinclair Erdwin, Deputy Director at AIADC, and thank you for joining us for uh, the AIADC Town Hall on the push for DC statehood. Uh, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. First, a uh, quick legal disclaimer. By participating in this webinar, you are granting your permission to be recorded and for the recording of you to be distributed as AIADC and the Washington Architectural Foundation may choose. Uh, also, throughout the presentation, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, the panel will be answering questions uh, throughout the presentation, uh, so please go ahead and type in your questions as you think of them. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Sinclair. And I'd like to welcome and thank everyone for attending today as we uh, have our AIDC Town Hall and discuss the push for statehood for the District of Columbia. My name is Brian Forehand, and I am a member of the AIADC Advocacy Committee. In February, the board of AIDC voted unanimously to support statehood for the district on the merits of the benefits that statehood will offer for the profession, our members, and the community which we serve. Today's event is a direct outcome of the synergy between the AIADC board and our advocacy committee. As part of our advocacy, we are developing an awareness campaign that will target professionals here in DC and nationwide and includes programming such as today's town hall. The work of the advocacy committee is focused on representing members and professional matters within our local community, interface, interfacing with AIA National's advocacy ad agenda and understanding how architects can, can contribute to the quality of life issues in our city. If you're interested in joining our committee, please visit our website, the link to which will be dropped in the chat. I also want to tease our, our next event on statehood, which will be held in the coming month, uh, and will be part of our popular pro provocation series. More detail on that will follow. Finally, you can learn more about our efforts to advance statehood for the district by visiting the DC statehood page on our website, which we will provide the link to in the chat as well. Today, we are thrilled to be joined by an impressive panel of individuals who will help us understand the, current, the historical, and, historical and current implications that the lack of statehood has had for Washington, DC, how statehood would benefit DC residents, why this issue has gained traction in recent years, and what architects can do to support statehood. First, it is an honor to welcome DC delegate to the US House of Representatives, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Congresswoman Norton has served the residents of the district in Columbia since 1991. She was born in Washington, D.C., where she attended Dunbar High School before leaving to attend Antioch College and Yale, Yale Law School. Ann Anderson is the chair of the D.C. League of Women Voters Committee for Full Rights for D.C. Citizens. She's lived in D.C. since 1964 and been a proponent of statehood since 1971. She's a clinical social worker in private practice with the Washington Therapy Guild. Chris Myers Ash is the author of The Senator and the Sharecropper, The Freedom Struggles of James O. Eastland and Fannie Lou Hammer, and the co-author of Chocolate City, Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital. He teaches history at Colby College and runs a nonprofit capital area New Manners Project. A native of Washington, DC, Chris earned his PhD from the University of North Carolina. Andrew Trueblood is the director of the DC Office of Planning. Prior to joining OP, Andrew was the Chief of Staff at DC's Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Andrew holds a Master's in City Planning from MIT and a BA from Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And last but not least, Christopher Takis is the Managing Director at SOM's Regional Offices here in DC and is the current President of AIDC. He has been a resident of DC for five years and credits his work as an architect for bringing him to DC from New York City. Uh, as Sinclair mentioned, throughout today's roundtable, we will be answering questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Kicking off our, present today, our presentation today, we've asked Ann Anderson to provide a brief Statehood 101 to bring us up to speed on how we got here. But first, let's address a frequently asked question. So a lot of people wonder what the flag would look like if DC becomes a state. And I know as architects, we concern ourselves with such matters of aesthetics. Well, the answer is that in fact, it doesn't look all that much different and perhaps barely noticeable upon casual observation. In fact, you may not have noticed that since 2019, 51 star flags have been flown along Pennsylvania Avenue. 
Um, but if you didn't notice, don't feel bad because neither did Vice President Pence in 2017 when a 51 star US flag was used as a backdrop at the European Union summit in Brussels. And with that, I will turn it over to Anne. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> what a hoot. Um, okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, and by beginning, I mean when DC was established. Since 1790, Maryland and Virginia gave parcels of land adding up to 10 miles square, as stated in the Constitution, to create the federal district. <clears throat> U.S. citizens, many of whom had fought in the Revolutionary War and were living in D.C., were still able to vote in Maryland and Virginia congressional and presidential elections during the 10 years after D.C. had been established. When Congress moved into D.C. in 1801 and passed the Organic Act, that immediately disenfranchised everyone living in D.C. from one day to the next. The congressional records show that even back then, they were concerned about turning D.C. citizens into subjects. So the idea that the founding fathers wanted it this way, it just isn't true. So many arrangements have been tried over the years. Local councils, assemblies, appointed bodies of various types. <clears throat> but Congress continued to exercise total control over D.C. as described in the Constitution. Significantly for us, they changed the size by retroceding the Virginia side back to Virginia just before the Civil War. They even established a territorial government in the 1870s. But when it became clear that there would be many African Americans elected in DC to the lower house, among other reasons, Congress changed the arrangement to a presidentially appointed commission a dictatorial arrangement that lasted for nearly 100 years. So now we jump ahead to <clears throat> the uh, 20th century, um, more recent history. So with the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s, we got the 23rd Amendment that allowed DC to vote for president. We also got our non-voting delegate to Congress, and limited home rule. It was also in the 70s that a constitutional amendment to give us representation in Congress was tried and failed. And the latest idea to simply shrink the District of Columbia again and make a new state out of the rest of the territory was born. So let's look at how we're governed now. This is a map of our eight wards. Our eight wards elect representatives to the DC Council along with five at large members. Our mayor functions like a governor with many state and county functions as well as normal municipal tasks. The council passes legislation, the mayor signs it, but nothing becomes law until the congressional review period has passed without any objections, which can take months. Our judges are appointed by the president. With no voting representation in Congress, in the House, and not even a voice in the Senate, we're cut out of any decision making at the national level. So let's look at some effects of this arrangement. <clears throat> we don't have enough time to explore all the effects of being a colony of the Congress, but here's some things that stand out. During the years that Congress prevented our needle exchange program, we ended up with the highest HIV AIDS infection rate in the nation. During the couple of years that they did not manage to pass that rider on some bill, and we were able to have a needle exchange program, our infection rate fell substantially. For the record, the DC budget has funds coming mostly from DC taxpayers with only about 25% coming from federal funds. But because Congress also controls local tax dollars, they've prevented us from using them to help low-income women. And then Congress usually treats DC as if it were a state when distributing block grants, for instance, usually about 500 times in the congressional se session. But 
Last year, they went out of their way to name us as a territory in the COVID relief bill, which shorted us by $750 million. The American Rescue Plan that recently passed has made DC whole again. And then on January 6th, if our mayor had been a governor, she could have called up the DC National Guard immediately and requested help from neighboring states, governor to governor. Instead, she had to get permission from the Department of Defense, which was slow in coming. So I mentioned on the screen here that many policies imposed on DC are discriminatory. For the record, the racism that is displayed is often not subtle. It ranges from microaggressions to intended insults. For instance, in 1967, when our newly appointed mayor commissioner, Walter Washington, submitted his first budget to the House District Committee, Chairman McMillan <clears throat> responded by sending a truckload of watermelons to his office. I always just have to stop and take a breath after that. We have tried many ways to get full rights for DC citizens, and it has become clear that in order to be on an equal footing with the rest of the country, the residential and commercial parts of DC need to be admitted as a state. So let's look at our progress. <clears throat> our momentum towards statehood has been accelerating. Between 85 and 2011, six bills were introduced. Then there were admission acts introduced in every Congress after 2011, and sponsorship has grown each year. Then in 2016, we voted overwhelmingly, 86%, to petition for statehood with a new constitution and boundaries. Last year, it passed the House, went to the Senate floor for the first time. And this year, it's passed again in the House, and S-51 has been introduced with record numbers of original co-sponsors. And as of today, we have 46 sponsors on the bill, uh, up from 45 yesterday. So, so let's look at the process of becoming a state, just so we're all on the same page. This is from the Constitution. It's Congress. It's up to Congress to admit new states. There's no requirement for a constitutional amendment. And because the Washington, D.C. Admission Act preserves a two square mile section of our federal district, we continue to follow the dictates of the Constitution that calls for a federal district no larger than 10 miles square and does not state a minimum size. So <clears throat> people are asking, why not just go back to Maryland? Well, Maryland would have to agree to the change of boundaries and you can see state boundaries can't be changed without the consent of the state. <clears throat> And most of the Maryland congressional delegation are co-sponsors of the Washington DC Admission Act. They don't want us. It would be quite chaotic political mess. And by the way, DC citizens voted to become a state. So we wanna have the same freedom to be represented in the halls of Congress as the Americans who live in the 50 states and the liberty to run our own local government and hold our own leaders accountable. Thank you. That was great, Anne. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, you know, I find it very interesting. Also, uh, the symbolism, obviously, of the the numbering of the bills S fifty one and H R fifty one. And with that, I would invite um, all of our panelists to turn on their cameras, and we will. Gallery view. Great. Um, and I do know as well, uh, we've heard from uh, the council member's office, or, or sorry, the um, congresswoman's office that she uh, is running just a few minutes late. She is in committee today. So we uh, hope to see her uh, join us shortly. Um, but with that, Anne, I'd like to actually start with you then. Um, in your role, you've presented and spoken uh, to a number of groups about statehood. Uh, not just in the DC area, but throughout the country. And I'm curious, what are the reactions from people living in other states when you talk to them about this issue? And do you find that they're generally receptive and different or opposed to the idea of statehood? Ah, well, yes, the, the league has traveled to 30 states over the last four years. And so not just me, but our team, uh, 
And, um, and as we've gathered the information, basically people say they don't really know much about it. Often I'm asked, do you actually live in the city? So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those. So really when people don't know and then they start hearing about it, I've had audience members just burst out, but that's an American. Um, and so there's a lot of people who really don't know. And when they do know, they're horrified. And I've only had a very few people who have said, no, I don't think so. Um, but they didn't really have a reason. They just didn't like it. So. And, and you mentioned some of the misconceptions, such as them asking, you know, well, do you actually live in D.C.? Do people actually live in the city? What are some of the misconceptions that you often here, maybe some of the stranger ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, yes. Do I live in D.C.? And of course I do, um, because I'm a member of the D.C. League of Women Voters. So how could I be else live somewhere else? Um, they there are other things like, but you don't. I mean, the federal government just supports you completely. So how would you do it if you became a state, you know, which is, you know, a real misconception, but they often think that. They often think that everybody in DC works for the federal government. No, we don't. <laughs> I have never worked for the federal government. Um, and then um, there are other concerns like, um, well, but, but, how could, uh, I mean, they're just flummoxed. I think it's, I think more than anything, people just get confused, like, wait a minute. And then they want to, they really do want to know how did this happen and why hasn't it already been taken care of? Um, so those are the, those are sort of the responses that I'm, I'm can bring up right now. So. Thank you. Uh, so Christopher, I, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, speaking of, support for DC statehood. Uh, in February, the AIDC board voted unanimously to support DC statehood. Uh, why did the board decide that this was such an important issue and, and why was this the year to put the board's support behind it? Well, Brian, I, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, as architects, we, um, we take our professional duties seriously. Um, our architects, like other professionals, take an oath to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the communities that we serve. And, um, and that means that we need to be better at uh, agents of, of positive change uh, to carry out our duties in design and planning, and serve, you know, serving uh, the, the community building of the future. We build, we build towards the future. There, there can't be a better way of being able to um, uh, extend uh, the, the power of the profession than to have representation in Congress. And if you think that that is trite or perhaps, uh, uh, I don't know, naive, ask any other architect of another state if they'd be willing to give up their Congress people and their senators. Yes. The answer is no. Uh, and in fact, that is not just an architectural perspective, that is a professional perspective. Um, as citizens, it is our right and it is our duty uh, to use every tool in the toolkit to do the right thing for climate action, to build social, uh, equitable communities, uh, to push the agenda of important things that matter to the future. And as architects, that is what we are committed to. And we are not fully empowered to do that as architects within a non-state. Great, thank you. Um, and I see that uh, the Congresswoman Norton has been able to join us. Congresswoman, uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I don't see me, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pleased to join you. The problem is that I'm in the middle of a committee markup and vote. <laughs> and that's why I have been absent without leave. Oh, not a problem at all. We, we greatly appreciate your, your taking the time to be with us today. Um, so I would like to actually ask you um, about the uh, support for D.C. statehood in Congress. 
uh, which is the strongest ever, uh, thanks in part to your steadfast leadership. And I'm curious, uh, from your perspective, what has changed over the past few years to shape this brown swallow support? And why do you think that it's taken so long for folks in, in and outside of Washington to recognize and care about the fact that hundreds of thousands of their fellow Americans are denied equal rights and representation? We owe this support to the fact that Dem when Democrats uh, came into power last year, last session, for the first time we were able to have hearings to tell the American people what they did not know. It turns out most didn't know that the 700, more than 700,000 residents of the District of Columbia didn't have the same rights they had. The hearings is what gave them that information. The markups gave them that information. And now we have 54% of the American people saying they support statehood for the District of Columbia. People were all over the map. Some thought we had the same rights. Many did not know. Uh, so with exposure to the fact that we are the only nation in the world or at least the only democratic nation, which does not give the same rights to the people who live in their nation's capital as everyone else. That seems an oxymoron. Uh, once they find that out, people climb onto this bill. So that's why we're having these growing numbers. Uh, we pay the highest federal income taxes in the United States. That in itself, or per capita, that in itself ought to deserve the award of statehood. We have a budget that is larger than the budget of 12 states. What more do you want from, from us uh, than that? Uh, we, we have a higher personal and gross domestic income than any state of the union. Our bond rating is greater than that of 35 states. If you ask me, and now increasingly if you ask we have overqualified for statehood. <laughs> this time it came. Yeah. I'm so pleased that the, 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 I know we've had to put off this forum with our architects and I'm so pleased to have you, especially now that we've had this invasion of the Capitol. <laughs> well, we're, we are happy to lend our support uh, to, to the efforts and the fight for statehood. Uh, and you, you certainly make a compelling argument. And I'm curious to know, even with you know, the groundswell of support, the greatest support we've ever seen, uh, coverage in the media still seems, in my mind at least, to be rather anecdotal about uh, the topic of statehood, especially compared with other issues. I mean, it's not treated as front page or lead off news. Do you, do you think that the media is taking this issue of DC statehood seriously? No, I, don't, I, I think the media only deals with front and center issues. The fact that you have the support of the president of the United States who has issued, excuse me, his own statement of support, uh, that we have the support of the House and the Senate. What you ha find happening here in the House where I'm sitting right now is people are focusing on the pandemic. Uh, they are not focusing on, on, on virtually any other issue at the moment. We're dealing at an issue, with an issue that, that I'm subcommittee chair of, and that is transportation issues. So you see, we've got a new president trying to press his issue straight uh, front and center. Now that, this, that we have the Senate for the first time, the most important word on statehood is that the majority leader has said, we will have a Senate hearing. And that will, the date hasn't been announced yet, but with a Senate hearing, that means we're making progress in the Senate as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, I, the last question I have for you, because I want to be respectful of your time, and I know you have to get back to your, your committee vote, but uh, for uh, folks that are living outside of D.C., I think we all understand for anyone living in D.C. why this is an important issue, but for folks living outside of D.C., uh, why should they care about statehood, and what would D.C. statehood actually mean for people throughout the country? Well, for people living under outside of our city, I think they would be shall I say, ashamed to find that they're living in a country where the people who live in their own nation's capital don't have the right to vote. I think for people living outside of our city to have a capital city that doesn't have two senators in there to express the views 
of more than 700,000 people. I think we want to be taken over off of that list, the list you would expect undemocratic countries to be on of countries, and it looks like we're on this list by ourselves, of, of countries that don't give the people who live in their own nation's capital equal rights with everybody else. Absolutely, absolutely understood. Great. Uh, well, thank I've, you. I've got a, I've, they, they tell me that the vote is coming, another vote is coming up now. All so, right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your, your time. Um, so I'd like to actually uh, switch to talking about uh, uh, planning a little bit. Uh, and so to uh, start that, um, and actually let me apologize. So uh, I want to address one other um, frequently asked question that comes up, and that is, what would DC actually look like if it became a state? Uh, so if we can take a look at it here. Um, and the answer, as you can see, is that the federal entity. Can you share, the, Brian? Sorry. Oh, is it not sharing? I apologize. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Sure. All right, hopefully that's better. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Um, as you can see here, the uh, federal enclave is actually what would be carved out uh, from uh, the rest of DC, and that would include all of the federal monuments, uh, the National Mall, uh, Tidal Basin, and so forth. Um, and it's worth noting uh, that this uh, federal enclave is very consistent with the Macmillan Plan uh, from over 100 years ago, which is the comprehensive planning, uh, planning framework uh, for the development of the Monumental Corps and the park uh, systems of Washington, D.C. Uh, so, Andrew, uh, I want to pose the next question to you. Uh, now that we understand what the areas, uh, what areas will constitute the new state of D.C., I want to ask you, what impacts does home rule have on planning the district today, and how would planning and zoning, including entitlements and approvals of projects, change in the area outside of the federal enclave and the newly formed state of D.C.? Sure. Uh, uh, thanks for that, and, and, and I appreciate the comments and the context before, because I think uh, many of those things that, that Anne mentioned and the congresswoman mentioned, I think I'll, will be, I'll refer to. But what's interesting about home rule is how it really, I don't know if people realize how deep it gets into uh, how, our, how we function as a city. Our zoning, uh, which every city does, uh, ha is a zoning commission of five individuals, two of whom are federally appointed, are from federal agencies are federally appointed. Um, our, we have a whole number of uh, areas that are, uh, or, or property, either areas of the city or projects that are, that have to go to the com uh, Commission of Fine Arts, which is wholly federally appointed. Uh, and I'll put, hold that for just a second, because I have more comments on that. Um, and the National Capital Planning Commission uh, has direct control over a number of federal interests in the city. So if you were to, to, to take those federal entities and focus them on the um, on the federal enclave, NCPC would still have um, a little bit of a, of a role as they do with Maryland and Virginia, but it would oftentimes be more advisory and more directly related to federal campuses. Um, and the district would then be able to take direct control over its zoning and, and other things. And it's worth mentioning uh, the CFA is, 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 has been in the news and, and AIA, we've been talking to you uh, when the, the uh, Trump administration um, uh, put forth their ill-advised, as, as the word I would use, and that's, I think, putting it kindly, executive order about um, neoclassical architecture and kind of di di dictating a kind of a, a, an architecture style. Uh, what's, what's important about that is the way it gets implemented through GSA and CFA would have significant impacts, not only on federal interests, but potentially on local interests. And, and you know, our interest in a city is having a city with all the diversity of a city, not that is a kind of a mausoleum to uh, you know that type of architecture. So um, I think we saw then exactly how much uh, control the the government you know could exert on our built form. Uh, even though I would say mostly to date we've had a relatively good relationship with the CFA and National Capital Planning Commission, where I'm a, a commissioner. 
uh, as well as other uh, federal entities that relate. And then the final thing I'll mention or as it relates to home rule is, um, this isn't really entitlement, but I think the National Park Service uh, has a great deal of impact on our public space in the city. Um, as you see, obviously much of the federal enclave will be National Park Service, but there are areas, pocket parks, neighborhood parks, even larger parks like Rock Creek or the, the Fort Circle parks that all I think could be uh, well maintained or run by the district. Uh, and so, you know, that would obviously be a discussion, but it would be a very different kind of discussion uh, if those were uh, within a state rather than as part of a federal enclave. Great, excellent. I think that's really, um, you know, useful information for everybody to have as they think about, you know, how we as architects and in the profession uh, will really be affected, um, optimistically <laughs> speaking, by uh, statehood. Uh, and with that, I see we're at the bottom of the hour, so Sinclair, I wanted to see if we could maybe address uh, one or two audience questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, quite a few good ones here. Uh, let's start with a question from uh, Leslie. Uh, she says that yesterday's uh, AI lunchtime learning seminar showed a map of the effect of rising sea levels on DC. Uh, and basically all the, the mall except for the Capitol was underwater. Uh, so which arrangement of DC governance with or without statehood would get the necessary dikes built to protect the critical infrastructure of DC? And if I may, I think, Andrew, that might be a good question for you. I'll, I'll take a shot. You know, I, I, I'll say, uh, as you notice, most of that uh, would be uh, in the federal enclave. Uh, but regardless, it, I think we see it as a predominantly federal role. Um, there are examples where we've worked together productively uh, with the federal government, including, um, including uh, some barriers, flood barriers that were built along 17th Street. Uh, to protect the Federal Triangle after flooding there. So it's been collaborative, uh, but I think if you look at most of those areas there, federal government, it is also worth mentioning other parts of the district would be, could be affected as well um, on both sides of the Anacostia River, for example, that would be in the state. Um, but as with all of these, as with the states, they work with the federal government, they work with FEMA predominantly, and we are proactively doing this type of resilience planning with the federal government, with National Capital Planning Commission, uh, National Park Service, I think, is now getting back onto that. I, I would argue that for the last four years, um, it's kind of the, you know, they sort of pretended that that was, uh, anyway, uh, maybe they weren't as proactive in planning for that those issues, um, but but we're very interested in those. Yeah, I, can I just add, Andrew, yes. uh, uh, you know, the, the, the critical urgency of addressing this, uh, especially for the mall and the tidal basin area is something that is of national importance. Uh, and this is something that obviously is, is important to residents of Washington, but also the visitors uh, that come to our capital city uh, and to the longevity of the monuments that are essentially America's front lawn. <laughs> and so um, you know, cooperation between a state government and the federal government seems to me like a better recipe uh, than than, than it would be between a city that's the subject of a federal government. Um, I put in the chat box for anybody who's interested some really creative ideas uh, that the Trust for the National Mall has put out in their ideas lab. And this is a competition to rethink how to do um, uh, uh, resiliency uh, strategies through design lens. Landscape architects put forward six, uh, six incredible ideas. Um, they're meant to be provocative. These are things that we as architects should be helping to rally around. Excellent, and thank you for sharing that. Um, and Sinclair, I think we have time for at least one more question in the audience. Great, uh, we've talked a lot about the arguments for statehood uh, and Elizabeth would like to know what if any substantive arguments are currently being made against statehood. Uh, maybe in particular as they relate to architecture. And uh, Chris, I'm gonna go to you first to see if you have any response to that. Ar uh, arguments against statehood. Oh, from, sorry, uh, oh, Chris, Chris, not Chris, Christopher, Christopher. yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say like about architecture. <laughs> uh, not, not sure how, specifically about architecture, um, but you know, there, there are different views against statehood that have come up over time. One is uh, that the district has a special status uh, and therefore was not envisioned as a state by the founders, uh, has, a, has a special status within the constitution as a federal district. Uh, 
uh, and so therefore should not be considered a state. Um, and you'll see this, you'll, you'll, you'll see this, see this uh, from opponents within Congress, you'll see it on social media, where people will say things that uh, statehood advocates like myself would find rather patronizing and insulting. They'll say things like, well, you know, you're, you, you know, you have 535 representatives in Congress because all of Congress and the senators are looking out for districts interests, so, you know, and that, um, that the founders had created the district to, to play a special role and we don't want to mess with that. Um, they'll also point to the 23rd Amendment uh, that Anne referenced about the, um, about granting district residents the right to vote uh, in, uh, in the Electoral College essentially you know, in, in our presidential elections. And that is a, an issue that would have to be resolved should statehood pass. Uh, Congress would have to, uh, to make sure because the constitutional amendment essentially would then double our uh, the district's uh, electoral presence in the in uh, electoral votes in the electoral college so those are the the, the substantive issues are, are about the constitution uh as Anne pointed out though um the constitution mandates a maximum size of the of the district but not a minimum size mm -hmm. i mean this was an insight that sam smith pointed out in 1970 in a, in a seminal article on statehood that kind of launched the modern movement to say look you can shrink it. Congress has, in fact, shrunk it before historically, uh, which is why it's shaped the way it, does, it is. And that if Congress were to so choose, it could indeed shrink that federal district and therefore uh, protect the, the federal district as mandated in the Constitution while still establishing uh, a state and, and providing for representation for district residents. Great, and I think that's actually a great segue to my next question for you, as a matter of fact, um, which is that, um, you know, if we uh, think about, uh, you know, one of the arguments, again, against uh, why D.C., um, as it is today, should not be a state is because we're currently, as a district, we're also a city. Um, and although, um, and, and actually Congresswoman Norton references, although a federal city state is not unprecedented, if we look at, uh, for example, in Europe, the capital cities of Berlin, Vienna, Brussels, or Paris, uh, one of the things that struck me in reading your book, Chocolate City, is that you describe how the territory was originally intended to contain uh, the city of Washington, which of course we know this image well, um, but in addition, it contained uh, the town of Georgetown, Maryland, the town of Alexandria, Virginia, town at the time, uh, and all of the un unincorporated lands were designated as counties. Uh, in fact, you describe how George Washington, in your words, employed the, employed the members of Congress to arrange the borders of the district to include Alexandria, Virginia, which lay several miles south, as you can see here. Uh, so my question is, first, why uh, extending the boundaries to include Alexandria was so important to George Washington? But I'm also curious, based on the fact that the District of Columbia was created as several towns and counties within a boundary, to what extent was it the intention of the founding fathers that this would effectively be more akin to a small state than the singular large city we think of it today? That's a great question. You know, there, there's, a, there's a long story about Washington and why uh, he, he insisted on, on stretching the boundaries. The original legislation started at the confluence of, of the Eastern branch, the Anacostia River and the Potomac, and moved northward and said, you know, anywhere in these 70 miles northward, uh, and he immediately focused on the, the, the intersection of the, the two rivers, the junction of the two rivers, and then insisted on bringing it further south toward his own plantation in Mount Vernon. Many members of Congress were, were somewhat appalled by this. Um, they, they acceded to his wishes, but they put in a stipulation that no federal buildings could be built on that side of the river, on the, federal, <laughs> on the Virginia side. Of the Potomac River. Um, there was concern about speculation, about the appearance of impropriety, the, the appearance of the president benefiting monetarily. You know, uh, Washington was a big speculator as well as a, a uh, military leader and, and politician. Um, but in terms of his vision, uh, his vision and L'Enfant shared the, his vision as well. Uh, Alexander Hamilton shared this vision of the nation's capital becoming a commercial and cultural hub. Uh, they very much saw this as, uh, as a city that would be the embodiment of the nation's aspirations. And so in their mind, and this was in direct contrast to what Thomas Jefferson and other sort of, uh, Jeffersonians had in mind, 
there they envisioned those grand European capitals you mentioned, you know, Vienna, Paris, you know, these capitals of the old world that were the center, uh, the new, the most important cities of their respective nations. And so that's what he envisioned. He saw the Potomac as a gateway to the West. Uh, and, and he very much wanted uh, the city to be a commercial capital. They did not talk in terms of statehood at that time. I mean, I think their, their concern, you know, at the, at, during the founding era, they had this very strong concern about the, the capital being, uh, being controlled by a state. And that if you put the, the nation's seat of government in a state, if you put it in Philadelphia, for example, then the state of Pennsylvania would have undue influence and power over the, the central government, right? I mean, their major concern at the time was, was establishing the supremacy of the national government. You got to remember, of course, when the constitution is written, it's written in response to the Articles of Confederation where the central government was so weak, it couldn't, it couldn't even raise any money. And so many founders like Washington and Hamilton who wanted a strong national government felt like you had to have exclusive jurisdiction over your state capital. So that idea of exclusive legislation was very important, but it was also at war with the other founding principle of the nation, which is no taxation without representation, right? That you should not be taxed by a government in which you have no representation. And that was a tension that they never reconciled. There were founders who saw that tension, understood that tension, but couldn't figure out a way to reconcile that tension. Uh, and so like other tensions in, within the constitution, uh, we have to fix it. You know, we have, we have to, to, to fix the shortcomings. I wanna bring it forward a little bit now um, to the middle of uh, the 20th century actually. Uh, and uh, in the book, Chocolate City, again, you, you talk about how DC became a sort of testing ground for social initiative. Uh, and one example that many of our audience are familiar with is uh, the so-called urban renewal project um, that took place in the middle of the last century, um, which at the time uh, described the practice of tearing down full communities to build new communities in their place. Um, and I'm curious, how did that affect Washington's uh, history? Um, and do you think this would have happened had DC been a state at the time? It's a great question. Uh, and urban renewal had a, had a tremendous impact on the, the city, not only in terms of the landscape, right? I mean, an entire community, 23,000 people was essentially wiped out. 99% of the buildings were raised um, and in their place went uh, you know, high rise apartments for, for middle and upper income people. And so it was a deliberate effort to uh, remove what, what planners at the time called urban blight and to, to revitalize the city and, and make it more attractive to the people who had been fleeing for the previous decade, you know, the middle and upper income uh, families who'd been moving out to the suburbs. Uh, and so the, the destruction of Southwest was really a, it helped invigorate the, the local civil rights movement. Um, you know, there were even songs about uh, no more Southwest, right? It, you know, that, that, we would not allow what happened in Southwest to happen again in other places. Uh, and th this motivates the, the anti-freeway movement that's largely successful in blocking uh, other freeways that were planned through, through Northwest and, and Northeast. Uh, it inspires the home rule movement. Um, and I think there's, there's you know, urban renewal was a national movement. It wasn't just in DC. You can see the effects of, of urban rule. Even up in my little town in, in central Maine, um, there was a protest movement against ur urban renewal in the, in the late 1960s to, to preserve the downtown that, that is still here uh, today. But so this is a national movement. So it's not as if, oh, if we were a state, it would have, everything would have been, been perfect necessarily. But the fact that there was no democratic accountability made it so much easier for policy planners to implement their vision over the wishes of the people who lived there, right? So in a, in a, in a functioning democracy, a plan like that would go before the people and, or the people's representatives at least, and the people would have an influence over that, that decision-making process. And if their politicians, if their representatives voted for something they didn't agree with, they could vote those politicians out. 
There was none of that in, in DC in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. You had three commissioners, as, as Anne explained, that were appointed by the president, all of whom were white men until 1961, where you got your first uh, black male commissioners, no female con commissioners ever. Um, and so planners could just go to the back room with these three men and they could cut the deal that they wanted to cut. They didn't have to worry about elections. They didn't have to worry about account accountability. They didn't have to explain it to anybody. They could just do it. And they could work with members of Congress, uh, none of whom represented DC, of course. Uh, and so you had many people uh, you know, who, who took an interest, particularly Southern segregationists, who took a, a particular interest in, the D in DC for their own agendas. Uh, and you, know, you think of, of William Natcher of Kentucky, who, who uh, almost single-handedly bottled up uh, the subway system for a decade because he wanted highways to be built. And so, so not having that representation meant we had no recourse except to take to the streets, which is essentially what the, the anti-highway movement did in the 1960s. They had to because they had no other recourse. And it's interesting, the, the highway discussion is still being one that's fought today. I know recently there was a Times article uh, about a young woman who's actually successfully caught the presidency here as part of the infrastructure bill to tear down uh, the on-ramp that is inside of her house, uh, another example of, of urban renewal. Uh, so Andrew, uh, the proposed name of the state, Douglas Commonwealth, pays tribute to Frederick Douglass. Uh, and the Frederick Douglass House is located in Ward 8, which with Ward 7 uh, has traditionally, have traditionally been underserved communities in DC, lacking much of the investment and development of every other ward in the district. Uh, would statehood benefit these underserved wards? I mean, I think statehood would benefit uh, all the district residents. I, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, really the disinvestment you see is as much a legacy of, of all of those factors that Chris mentioned. I mean, he was talking about Southwest, but if you look at the highway that was built uh, east of the river, if you look at um, kind of the suburbanization that was really fostered, uh, I think all of those things led to disinvestment in the city generally, but especially uh, in, in, in African-American communities. Uh, and you layer that obviously with this, the de facto and de jure segregation in the city uh, that, that caused that. Um, and so, you know, those, some of those were, 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 you see it across the country, but they were certainly supported by segregationalists uh, in, in Congress uh, and by the National Capital Planning Commission, which was not accountable to district residents as well at the time. So um, I think that's a, sort of the legacy you see. And I believe with home rule, you begin to see more investment in Ward 7 and uh, Ward 8. I just, you, you know, when you asked this, one thing that came to mind, a story is, uh, that in the 19, you know, in the turn of the century, uh, Congress was, didn't really want the district to have libraries because they were sort of concerned that they would become a, a liability and something that they'd have to pay for to run. Uh, some of the libraries, like in Woodridge, were actually public-private partnerships, and that's the way that early on in the 1920s, how we got around that is sort of developers and others would sort of fund these projects. Um, and I think that is it really a, is kind of a, the ethos that was brought to uh, oftentimes investments. And you see that uh, resulting in Ward 7 and 8. Um, but I do think that with things like home rule, I mean, with, with things like home rule, it became better. Statehood would, I think, uh, improve our op opportunities even more uh, to ensure that investments flow there, that we get the federal investments that we need, that we have the voices uh, that can actually vote uh, both in both houses uh, to ensure that those investments go, uh, you know, are, are aligned with our goals as a city. So I see it, you know, I think we have done much better over the last 40 years, but there's more opportunity, certainly with home rule. I mean, with, sorry, with statehood. Sure, sure. And, and I want to pick up on something else you referenced and Chris references as well, uh, which is, you know, the emphasis on the development in the city to really support uh, commuters. Um, and so uh, from a planning perspective, if we did gain statehood, uh, would that allow us to implement more of the strategies such as congestion pricing or, you know, uh, some of the other uh, uh, efforts to sort of curb uh, DC being sort of seen as that commuter city and really invest in, in our citizens? I guess I'll take maybe a first shot. You know, I think, as you mentioned, the commuter tax 
is is outlawed by home rule. Uh, so insofar as statehood would uh, change that, uh, it would certainly allow the, those opportunities to be uh, considered. I think it might be more of a legal question uh, in terms of how exactly the language uh, goes uh, and how it plays out. Um, but I think the bigger point uh, is that it would allow uh, the Douglas Commonwealth uh, to make decisions about how it taxes, uh, how it raises funds um, and how it funds uh, what it, it needs to. And, and I think how it can do, you know, so equitably uh, in a way that uh, that makes sense. So I think it would eliminate some of those um, uh, some of, it would eliminate or reduce some of the barriers that we have right now to, to full autonomy. Thank you. Uh, and Christopher, I want to go to you uh, for one last question, which is uh, just uh, in your mind, why, why should uh, architects care? What are some of the impacts you imagine the DC uh, statehood would have on the profession? Well, you know, I'm really inspired by this discussion, uh, even more than I was before uh, on this subject. Uh, I think, you know, Andrew just mentioned uh, you know, the, the sort of the big point here about having agency. And that, that's what this comes down to. Chris mentioned also that the flip side of that is accountability. And having both is what you get when you are a democracy. I think for, for our profession to thrive and to have the meaningful impact on a national scale, we need to have the full rights of, uh, of a state. And um, there is just such unbelievable talent uh, here in the district. We have so many design professionals flying under the radar, uh, outpacing the, the actual numbers that we have, but we don't have influence nationally. And that is something that you can only have if you have both agency and accountability. Absolutely. Uh, Sinclair, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to some more audience questions. Great. Um, again, if you want to submit something, you can use that Q&A box to do so. Um, I think first, let's take a question from Jack, uh, who asks, what infrastructure would uh, be needed to uh, add to the state of D.C. that does not exist today? Would a new capital area be identified for the state of D.C.? So who would like to take a first stab at that? I'm looking at Andrew or Christopher, perhaps. <laughs> Well, I think if you pull up the map of Douglas Commonwealth, I believe it actually loops out the Wilson building, the John A. Wilson building on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, so I think, I believe, if, I'm if I remember correctly, uh, although I don't have it in front of me, um, that uh, that would be, uh, that would be kind of continue to serve as the, the seat of the, what would be the state government. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, you see uh, on the map on the right, uh, where Pennsylvania, you see how it, you can actually see it looped out. It, it doesn't follow Pennsylvania. It actually loops out um, the Trump Hotel, and then it loops out. Uh, it loops out the, or it cuts out the Wilson Building. So mm -hmm. I think the answer is uh, that we would basically just reformulate uh, uh, the district building would become the state house, uh, the mayor would become the governor, uh, and the council would become the legislature uh, for the for the for the state. So re renaming is one option. Uh, rethinking is another option. Um, I, I, no one's talked about it, but why not think about building a state capital in a different ward? Absolutely. So can I just say a couple things about this? Absolutely. Uh, um, you know, one of the, these are some of the questions that I often get asked when people are, well, what's it going to look like? And, do, you know, how many? And the, the first thing I would say is we should read our new constitution because that will help us a lot know what we can do and what we can't do. Um, there's also a long period of transition. Uh, and there's also two years in, we are gonna have a state constitutional amendment or a constitutional convention. Uh, that's part of the current constitution. So all of those things are often, you know, it's like, it, I think this is part of the colonial mentality that we have to try to figure out how to rethink, Christopher. Yeah, rethink. Because it's like, oh, if we are a state, we actually can decide stuff. You know, 
we can actually make something happen because we want it to happen. We don't have to uh, do all of these jumping through hoops and then hope that Congress will let us, which is why I'm calling it a colonial mentality. <laughs> and I'd love to just jump in here. I think that's such a great point, Anne. Um, <clears throat> and mind you, none of this was demanded of other states before they come into the union, right? right? The other states didn't want to see plans for the Capitol buildings um, and, or, or anything like that. I think part of the, the resistance, we've talked about that, I think a lot of it is just inertia and the fact that it's been 50 years plus, since almost 60 years uh, since, actually more than that, 60 years since uh, Alaska and Hawaii, the last states were admitted to the union. So people have quite literally forgotten how to do it. Uh, this is by far the longest stretch in American history where we have not added any new states. And, you know, I know there's a question about partisan, you know, is this a partisan issue? And, you know, everything that nowadays becomes a partisan issue, and you hear this term of, about a, a power grab, this is just a power grab by congressional Democrats. Um, and I, as a historian, I always, I always kind of laugh and sort of say, well, if you want to talk about the, a power grab and, and what explains why the Senate, for example, is so wildly unrepresentative of the American people, you have to go back to the late 19th century, where the Republican majority, you know, Republicans dominated the national government for the half century after the Civil War. And they pushed through a dozen new states in 35 years, uh, beginning during the Civil War. You know, so when, when Democrats left, seceded, Republicans got to work. They, they, they admitted Nevada when Nevada had like 21,000 people in it. Uh, Nevada is owned 85% owned to this day by the federal government. DC is about 25%. Nevada is 85%. No one says let's take Nevada away. West Virginia was carved out of an existing state during wartime. Nobody talks about the constitutionality of whether West Virginia should be a state. Uh, they admitted six states in less than one year, including North and South Dakota that were split in half just because they wanted four uh, senators in, in uh, the Senate rather than two. This power grab in the late 19th century, what it means is that rural states are vastly overrepresented compared to urban areas in this country. Uh, and if you look at where the resistance in Congress is, it's in the, precisely those states that are now blocking the attempt of district citizens to, to have represent, representation in their national legislature. Excellent. And Sinclair, I believe we had maybe one more question. Uh, yes, we have one from uh, Douglas who asks, uh, is this simply a partisan political issue uh, which would have been done a long time ago? I think Without Chris, which, probably just, <laughs> trying to go. sorry. <laughs> I think maybe you just sort of add to that. I mean, that what is that. interesting is it could have been done a long time ago. I mean, the statehood vote in the 1990s uh, lost significantly, even though the Democrats had significant majorities in, in the House and the Senate and the presidency. Uh, Bill Clinton did not really support it. Um, Democratic members of Congress from, Dem uh, from Virginia and Maryland didn't support it, although Republican Tom Davis did. Um, and so, yes, it could have been done a long time ago. Um, you know, George Will, the conservative columnist who is himself an opponent of statehood, actually made a very good point which, when, he's at, when he asked that question. And he said, well, what's changed is Democrats have changed. And I think that's true. And, and something we haven't talked about that I think is putting uh, renewed energy into this movement uh, are the racial justice protests of the last year. You know, so starting last summer, uh, people started to view DC statehood with new lenses and began to see it as a racial justice issue as well as a matter of, of moral and political justice. Uh, and I think that's where the energy has come from, certainly within Congress and pushing Democrats to change and see this as a, a fundamental issue of, of racial justice. I see we are approaching the end of our hour um, I, I did want to address one uh, last question that I see in the, uh, the Q&A uh, from Carolyn asking how uh, advocacy committee and, and the AADC uh, by extension is uh, working with other organizations uh, for one statehood. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, this uh, presentation is part of that effort, uh, as part of our educational efforts to really inform on the issues. 
Uh, we are also, as I mentioned, doing a provocations next month. So certainly please be on the lookout for that. Uh, and we have actually reached out to a number of the statehood organizations and are working with them. Uh, obviously the uh, League of Women Voters in DC, thank you, Anne. Um, and uh, we also hope to do, uh, or, or at least to offer uh, the opportunity to other chapters throughout the country uh, to meet with us and to, you know, Christopher and myself uh, will perhaps have uh, these brief presentations to them uh, because they clearly have the opportunity to convince their uh, elected officials to vote on this issue, which unfortunately we cannot vote on. Um, so hopefully, uh, and, and, and actually I would just ask you as well, what are ways that people can get involved if, they, uh, if they'd like to get involved in other ways? Well, um, for sure, um, you're welcome to go to lwbdc.org because we have a DC State of Toolkit and we have a number of videos so people could get more involved in terms of educating themselves. Um, we also have a postcard mailer system where people can take postcards and, um, and mail them to their uh, friends and uh, relatives um, out and oh, here it is. <laughs> and you just fold it over and, you know, write your name and say, hey, help us. And then <laughs> they send it back. They send this one back to us. Couldn't, so, couldn't be any easier than that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, and well, those are the people that can vote. So. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists today. I really think this is a very interesting uh, and hopefully uh, Provocative, if I can, if I can use the word, uh, borrow it from. I hope Douglas Palladino will allow me to borrow that word. Uh, conversation, and I hope it's gotten a lot of people thinking about why statehood uh, really would help uh, uh, architects in the profession of architecture. Um, so, thank you to all of our uh, audience members today, and uh, I hope uh, Sinclair. I will turn it over to you in case there's any closing remarks. Uh, the recording will be available to everyone, uh, likely later this afternoon, uh, so keep an eye on your email so you can send this around to all of your uh, friends and family, and uh, please fill out the survey that you'll receive as well. We really enjoy getting feedback from you. And thank you so much again to our panel. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Brian, Have a thank great day. You. It was fun. I know. Bye-bye.